call is now being recorded. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class. Welcome to all our online students, in-person students, and our e-learning students who will be listening to the lecture later on. We'll uh, continue with our study on, what are we studying? The ministry of the evangelist, prophet, and a pastor, and a teacher. Okay. So we'll begin with a word of prayer. Can I ask any one of our online students to unmute your mics and pray, please? Anyone? Online students, anyone can? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you have given us, my Master. We pray that the Holy Spirit will teach and guide us today's word, whatever we are supposed to learn, my Master, that we may grow in your word on daily basis and experience your presence and power in our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Gertrude. So um, we were, we are in chapter one still, introduction to the fivefold ministry, and I'll just complete chapter one uh, today, and then I will leave chapter two onwards for uh, Pastor Paul Emmanuel to teach because he's teaching this course, and uh, so he will uh, begin from uh, Monday. So he will teach you from chapter two. So in chapter one, what are some of the things we uh, looked at? Anyone remembers? What are some of the things we studied in chapter one? Fivefold ministry. Yes, we're looking at the fivefold ministry in chapter one. And what did we understand about the fivefold ministry office? It's a divine call. Yes, it's a divine call. It's given by Jesus, or given by God to everyone. No, it's given to some of them okay a few of them it's not given to everyone okay what uh, which gift of the spirit everyone receives the gifts of the holy spirit the nine gifts of the holy spirit okay we also each receive membership gifts but it's all different okay what else did we learn okay we receive the special grace of the special empowering uh, to uh, to enable us, empower us to fulfill our calling and our function. Okay, what else? The gift and calling always together. The gift and the calling always go together. They are parallel. They run parallel like a railway track. Yes. So when you receive your gift, when you receive your calling, your function, uh, which God has already purposed even before the foundation of the world, right? He is already. Uh, giving you the grace that is needed to enable you to fulfill that calling and that function. Great. Anything else? Yes, we are not just given a one. Some people can be have have more than a one okay. uh, ministry office that they are called to. Okay. What else? The five phone ministry office is given for what reason? For to the unity the body of, of the church. Okay, to build the body of Christ. Okay, what else? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Yes. To preach gospel. To equip and to perfect the saints. To perfect the saints, that means completely equip the saints so that the saints can do the work of the ministry and it can result in the building of the body of Christ. And to, uh, and, uh, to when will this go on? Till Jesus comes, okay? So what is the end goal of the fivefold ministry? Huh? To come to the fullness of, the, uh, of Christ, that means the perfect, mature man, fullness in Christ, what else? To come to the knowledge of the Son of God, yes. Unity of the faith, very good. So uh, the goal of these fivefold ministry, why God has given it to the church, 
is so that we all come to the unity of the faith, we all come to the knowledge of the Son of God, and also we all come to a perfect full measure of uh, the stature in Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, we also read uh, about this fivefold ministry office. Where do we find the fivefold ministry office? Fort Levin. Okay. Where else do we find it? First Corinthians yes, twelve first, twenty. Twelve twenty eight. Yes, first Corinthians twelve verse twenty eight. Yes, to thirty one, and there it says, "We called first to be apostles, second Prophet. prophets." Teachers, okay. evangelists, and pastors. That is in uh, that is in Ephesians chapter four, verse eleven. I'm asking about First um, Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twenty-eight to thirty-one. First apostles, second prophets, then teachers. third teachers. Teacher. Okay, evangelists. Fourth are evangelists. How do we know is evangelists? This is mentioned yep. there. Gifts of healings and miracles. Yes, the gifts of healing and miracles is attributed to evangelists and then helps and pastors, administration. How do know? Yeah, help and administration is for pastors. Okay. Now, um, why is this order stated in First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28? First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Then, huh? okay, the governmental structure in the in the uh, that God has instituted, okay, governmental responsibility and authority that God has established. What else? There is anointing goes in each. There is anointing for each of the ministries, okay. But here I'm asking, why is this order stated in First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twenty-eight? First of all, it's governmental responsibility and authority, but the most important thing, yes, that is how it unfolded in the early church. God gave first apostles, then came the prophets, then came the teachers, and then the pastors, okay? So we see as it unfolded in the early church, and that is why Paul is writing it in that order over here. Where do we find the gifts of the Spirit? First Corinthians chapter 12 verses 7 to 11. Where do we find the membership gifts? Romans chapter 12 verses 6 and 8. Okay. So um, we'll move on. Um, so we see that, uh, just moving on in your notes, there is an anointing that goes with each ministry gift, okay? So we, we already finished this, right? What is anointing? Last class, yes or no? Yes. Yes, what is anointing? Yes, it is a special empowerment or it is divine enablement um, that is given by the Holy Spirit to carry out specific ministries or carry out specific task and it's basically spiritually equipping a person enable them to fulfill their god-given calling effectively okay so why is anointing important why is anointing important okay to fulfill god's calling yes with our own uh, efforts, in our own human strength, in our human wisdom, we are very limited, we are very insufficient, and it's God's anointing that brings the power of God into ministry, and it ensures that we accomplish His purposes, okay? So it allows God to minister beyond and operate beyond our physical abilities, so to bring in the supernatural or to bring in the supernatural, bring in a supernatural impact into the ministry. Okay. So we see that each of the ministry gifts, whether it's an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, worship leader, children's church teacher, you know, whatever, there is a specific anointing that is tailored for each role. Okay. For example, um, uh, the anointing for the office of a pastor. 
Okay, so the person who's called into that office has a special anointing to fulfill that office, that calling. It just enables him to hear clearly from God. It enables him to speak God's word with authority. Okay, what does a pastor's anointing empower him? How does a pastor's anointing empower him? To lead the sheep. Also, to feed the sheep, right? To feed the sheep with green pastures. You know, how can you, you have to not, just not lead the sheep, but also take care of the sheep. So you need to feed them well, okay? So take care of the flock, basically giving them a heart of love, heart of compassion, a heart of wisdom, just like Jesus had a heart of compassion, heart of wisdom, which is very important and necessary for uh, the, the role of a calling of a pastor. Okay. Now, is anointing a one time event? Is an, it keeps on growing. growing. Yes, it keeps on growing. Thank you, Lucy. Keeps on increasing as the person remains faithful to the calling God con and continues to seek God, the anointing continues to. Okay. So the gifts and anointing come from where? From the Holy Spirit from heaven. Okay, your growth in godly character and maturity is also important for your anointing. Okay, and we know that godly character and maturity is something that is progressive. We grow, right? And each time you take uh, a new step of a new level of obedience, a new level of godliness, a new level of maturity, a new level of seeking God, knowing God, then there is a new level of God's anointing that comes upon your life, okay? So how does your anointing grow? Even as you step into newer levels of obedience, greater levels of obedience, new levels of godliness. What do we mean by godliness? Holiness, Holiness okay. Pursuing God, okay? intimacy with God, greater levels of greater intimacy with God, which leads you to a greater level of maturity in your walk with God, in your understanding of God's word, understanding of his will for your life. You will find new levels of God's anointing on your life. Okay. So the things that you learn today will basically prepare you for tomorrow. And God will prepare us to fulfill his plans and purpose. Okay, so the preparation process is very important for God. We all don't like preparation, right? We all like action. <laughs> right? We find preparation very, very boring. We find preparation very difficult. We are all an instant generation. Everything should be quick and fast. That's why we have so much of instant food. Just take the food packet, put it in hot water, or just keep it in the microwave and it's ready to, or just pour some hot water, it's ready to eat. Okay, we are an instant generation. We like everything that is very quick and very fast. You know, everything that comes very quickly uh, to us. But it does not work like that in the spiritual realm and also in certain parts of the natural realm. Yes or no? Right? You have to wait. Right? Suppose you want to be um, a junior uh, professor, uh, 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 teacher, lecturer. What is the qualification you need? A junior lecturer in a college. What is the qualification you need? Mm -hmm. huh? B. Ed. Okay. For lecturer, you need just B. Ed. Yes, you need an M. A. or M. S. C. or you know you. If you want to be a professor, senior professor, mm -hmm. PhD. Mm -hmm. Yes, you need a PhD, right? So for PhD, you need greater preparation process. You want to become a doctor. Yes. Four or five years, right? Nowadays, even that four years is not enough. Everybody goes into postgraduate because that helps them to uh, get into a better place. So, so much of preparation time in the worldly sense, right? When you're born, you do, you just don't think, hey, I want to be a doctor, engineer, a chef, you know, a teacher, and immediately you don't start teaching or preaching or becoming a pastor or a doctor. You go to school. You know, 10, 10 years of schooling life, two years of, um, uh, uh, you know, PUC, then post-graduation, post-graduation. There's so much of preparation process. But when it comes to spiritual aspects, we think why God is taking so much of time, right? 
God has called me to be an apostle. God has called me to be a pastor. Why should I study in Bible college for three years, four years? Some people study six years. Why six years? Why four years? Such a waste of time, right? But greater the calling, greater the preparation, okay? So it's important and God loves to take that preparation, take us through that preparation time. Why is preparation time so important for God? To make you to a mature man, to make you perfect, to become Christ-like, yes? Why? Okay, it builds you, builds up your spirit man, builds you up spiritually, draws you closer to God, yes? What else? You're better equipped, yes? In the preparation process, what else does God deal with? Yes, our character, right? Our heart attitudes, you know, some of those things that are, uh, you know, this uncontrollable pet sins. Pet, you know what is a pet, right? You have a pet dog, pet cat. We have pet sins. Some sins that we just, you know, live with it. We think it's just a pet sin. We don't want to deal with those things. And you know, those things can become very, very harmful, very, very dangerous. Uh, it can, um, you know, cause accidents. And you know, accidents can be very, very fatal. And even if it's not very fatal, some of the accidents can take time for you to, the body to repair and come back. Sometimes you can't even use that part of the body for a certain amount of time. So there are sins like that, that God knows can be very fatal. You know, that can bring a downfall for your own life, ministry, whatever you're doing, can impact and affect so many people around you. So God takes that preparation process to deal with some of our heart attitudes, some of our, uh, you know, um, unconquered weaknesses, our unconquered sins, you know, that we have not dealt with, our weaknesses. Sometimes we think uh, our weaknesses comes from whom? Satan, he's our enemy. It's sometimes so sad because we blame everything on Satan. But it's sometimes it's our own. When, that, when do we get tempted? Not when Satan is tempting us, when we are drawn away by our own desires and we give in, right? So Satan, what he does is just puts a thought, just puts one idea. But we are ones that we are drawn in our own desires and then we get pulled away, we get caught into a net and that destroys our life. Okay, So that is also what Bible talks about, temptation. So God is very interested in the preparation process. So when God calls you into this five-fold ministry offices, you know, he will take time to prepare you because some of those unconquered weaknesses, those pet sins, unconquered sins can be so fatal, can be so dangerous, can be so harmful, for your life, for the life of the church, and also for the life of people that you are interacting with or building up or, you know, uh, ministering to, okay? So how does God prepare us? Yes, to his word, to the Holy Spirit. Well, how else does he prepare us? Oh, yes, through life experience, teachings, through other people's sermons, men and women of God, their lives, their examples, their testimonies. Okay, so let's look at how God prepares us through His Word. Can somebody please read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, please? Oh, I think if online students, I mean, if you read, we won't be able to hear, right? Huh? Oh, you, can, you can do that. You can read with that. Online students, anyone likes to read 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, please? 2 Timothy, sister? Yes, 3, Second. 16 and 17. Okay, sister, 2 Timothy, verses 3 and 16. No, chapter 3, yes. verses 16 and 17. Okay. All scripture... All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. So all of scripture 
is inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine. What is doctrine? Teaching. Okay. For reproof. What is the meaning of reproof? Huh? Reproof is basically, yes, maybe uh, to correct. Um, also, like, you know, bring, like, you know, kind of actually uh, bring an accusation so that it can correct you for correction, for instruction in righteousness, in right living. Okay, so that the man of God can be completely and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the word of God prepares us, you know, for what the plans and purposes it has for us. The Holy Spirit, okay, 2 Corinthians 3.18, someone else on the online students can read, our in-person students can't read because, you know, the, they won't be heard because we are not able to access the settings. Can somebody... From the online students, please read. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same in age from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. So here we see that, you know, it's the Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit that transforms us into the image of God, transforms us into the likeness of God from glory to glory. Okay. We also see that other people um, also that we associate with, they can also prepare us for our calling. Can somebody please uh, read Proverbs 27, 17, please? Online students, Proverbs 27, 17. Shall I, sister? Sure, you see. 27, 17, right, sister? Yes. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Amen. So, as you know, uh, people working with metal, they use iron to sharpen another piece of iron the same way a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Okay, so when we associate with people who are growing spiritually, spiritually minded, you know, uh, flowing in the anointing, flowing in the gifts, we can also learn from them. Okay, and they can also impart into our lives. We also learn from life experiences right when we make choices bad choices good choices whether it's good times bad times god teaches us he prepares us through life experience now what are some of the things that we need to keep in mind as we go through the preparation process when god is preparing us what should we do yield more to him submit be in obedience the quicker you yield the quicker you have that God is not looking for perfect vessels. God is not looking for gold, silver vessels. He's using, he's looking for what kind of vessels? Submissive, yielded vessels. Okay. So don't say, hey, I'm not uh, capable. I'm not smart. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, wise. I'm not talented. God is not looking for talented people. He's looking for yielded vessels where he can pour out his, 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 and he can, Pour out his anointing to empower us and give us the ability to fulfill what God has called us to do. What else? We should be evil vessels, yes. Online students. Okay, obedience, willing to learn. Okay. What should you keep in mind as you go through God's preparation process? No answers from my online students. Godliness. Okay, godliness. Yes, that means desiring for more of God, intimacy with God, okay? We have to learn to cooperate with God in the preparation process. Look at what 1 Corinthians 3, 9 says. Yes, submission, yes. What does 1 Corinthians 3, 9 say? Can one of our online students please read, please? Today I need your help. Our in-person students can't do that. First Corinthians. Yes, go ahead, Deepu. Three verse nine. 
three verse nine. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Amen. Amen. So here it says we are God's fellow workers, or it says we need to cooperate with God. We need to work alongside with God. Yes, God gives us the calling. He enables us. He empowers us. But all depends upon us cooperating with Him. Also, your attitude matters. Yes or no? Yes, your attitude matters. Also, you need to persevere and endure consistency. Okay, the more you're consistent in doing what you are doing, you don't give up. You don't um, uh, let go easily. You know that is going to demoralize the enemy. You know what is going to demoralize the enemy? Satan. Satan will try to distract you. Uh, try to disturb your focus, refocus your attention on something else. But when he sees you as somebody who is not demoralized, somebody who never gives up easily, someone who never stops, just relentlessly pursuing God, just going after God, just doing what God has called you to do, that demoralizes the enemy. Okay. So consistency is very, very important. Consistency is where the power is. Also, you need to be faithful in what does Jesus say? You need to be faithful in how little things, okay? In small things or little things, you need to be faithful, and then God will promote you to the next. Also, what is the other thing that we need to uh, be keep in mind as we go through the preparation process? Don't become too complacent, don't become too lazy, don't become too comfortable. Allow God to stretch you. Okay, and we know that sometimes God takes a long time for our preparation. We looked at the life of David and you know um, Moses and Paul, right? Such a lot of preparation time, thirty years, and all of, uh, you know those those years they had to spend just preparing themselves to fulfill God's call. So preparation time is never wasted time. Greater the calling, greater the preparation. So. You want to be a pastor, apostle, prophet, teacher, greater the preparation. Okay. And don't be hasty to get done with the preparation and jump before God is, you know, in God's timing. Okay. Run, let the preparation course run its time. And the important thing to keep in mind is it's important to keep within the area of your calling and your gifting. Don't try to do something. Don't try to become somebody who God has not designed you or purposed you. Okay. So stay within the area of your calling and your gifting. Don't try to become something God did not design you. Don't try to do something that God has not purposed for you. So we saw the life of William Brenham, right? William Brenham was called to be what? By God, he was called to be a healing evangelist, right? He was. He was gifted in what? Healing, yes. Was he gifted in teaching, preaching, pastoring? No. But when the healing revival came to a so-called end, what did William Brenham do? He started teaching, right? He started teaching, which was not his calling, which was not his area of gifting. He knew that. He knew he was not gifted in that. He knew he was just a healing evangelist. And some people who were close to him also told him that. But what did William Brenham do? He continued teaching. And the saddest thing is that he ended up teaching such wrong doctrines. So if you read William Brenham's doctrines, it's like really out of the world. You know, why? Because why did God not call him into teaching? First of all, he was not he was from a very poor background, so he was not. Uh, well read, well taught. He has not gone to a Bible college. He's not even read the Bible, but just God used him mightily for me for, as an healing evangelist. Now, when the healing evangelism, that time had come, revival period had come to an end, what should William Brenham have to do? He had to wait on God and ask God what next, right? But into that, he jumped into teaching and such a lot of wrong, false teachings and doctrines and it's sad that even his wrong teachings and doctrines are even there even today like some of our students were saying 
why are you teaching about William Branham? Do you not know that he has all false doctrines and teachings? Yes, we were just looking at his life to see what was the end result when we, you know, step away from God's calling and gifting and we try to do something that God has not designed us. Now, we need to remember that God has designed us, wired us specifically for specific things. So even when I look at my own life, when I'm asked to do something, I find that very difficult to do it, you know, and I know that it's so much of a struggle and because of this, it's not coming easily for me, it's not my area of expertise or my gifting, I'm finding myself you know, struggling and it's becoming very stressful for me. And then I'm realizing, hey, God has called me for children's ministry, right? And there for me, everything just flows so easily, so spontaneously. I enjoy it. So when I'm called to do something, when somebody else tells me do some this sphere or this work, it becomes something difficult for me because I know I'm, I, I sense, hey, this is not my area of expertise. This is not where God has called me. So it's very important for us to stay in the area of your calling and gifting and don't try to become something God has, did not design you or wired you for. Okay. Yes. So Abhishek says we should not look for shortcuts. Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to repeat what you're saying. So one of my uh, in-person students is saying during those times when we get carried away, does the Holy Spirit not? Okay, does the Holy Spirit not intervene? Does the Holy Spirit not convict us? What do you think? What do you think in William Brenham's case? Would the Holy Spirit would have would God have spoken to him? Yes, yes, because he had so many times it's encountered, uh, you know, experiences of when God really ministered to him. Like when, when he had this whole experience of you shouldn't, when God told him when he was very young, you shouldn't be smoking and drinking. But when when he was a teenage and he got into into high school and so when he got into his peer pressure, started smoking and drinking, what happened? When he was smoking and drinking, what happened? He experienced that same, the sun, there was that whirlwind and he could hear the voice of God and immediately that cigarette is to fall off or he would just drop that glass of alcohol and he would run away from that place, right? How did, why did he do that? Because he experienced God's move. He experienced God telling him, hey, remember, you shouldn't be doing this. So when, you think when he was teaching all those really out of the world false doctrines, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have convicted him or spoken to him? Yes, it would have. He, yes, he would not have listened. Because why did he not listen? Why did, why did William Branham not listen? Even when his own close associate told him, Lindsay, when told him that, you know, hey, you're not called for teaching, don't teach, he did not listen to him. Why? Why did William Branham get into teaching when the healing revival period had come to an end? He was not getting familiarity. He was not getting that kind of visibility. He was not getting that kind of acknowledgement. And he thought, hey, you know, uh, people are going to forget me. I'm going to be a, become a nobody. So to become a somebody, he put, took on the role of a, um, uh, uh, a, a teacher. And it is so sad to read all of the wrong teachings and doctrines that he has um, promoted, which is still there today. There are some people who believe uh, still in William Brenham's teaching and still advocate that, and it's very sad. Okay, so uh, these are some of the things that we need to keep in mind in the preparation process. Okay, so there are different stages of preparation process that God takes us to: spiritual growth, character development, and skill and knowledge. Okay, so these are the areas. Can we uh, possess more than one ministry gift? Yes. Uh, can you give me an example? Pastors, Pastors in churches, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But are they called the prophetic office? All of us can prophesy, but are we called into the prophetic office? No. See? So all of us can teach, all of us can do evangelism, but are we called into that office? Yeah. So who is somebody who is an example of Jesus? Jesus okay. Apostle Paul, yes, who somebody who operated in multiple ministry gifts. Uh, look at First Timothy chapter two, verse seven. 
and Second Timothy chapter one verse eleven. In that, Paul identifies himself as. Just read for yourself and answer, please. First Timothy two seven and Second Timothy one eleven. Paul identifies himself as apostle and a preacher. Apostle, preacher, and a teacher as well. Okay. So can a person demonstrate more than one function, or can be called into more than one function? Yes, they can. Okay. And so sometimes even people can start with one ministry gift and they can be called into other ministry gifts as well. Okay. So somebody who plants churches is called into apostolic ministry. They can also be somebody who grounds believers in the word that is a calling into teaching ministry. Okay. But it's important to balance those gifts. And for that, we need to constantly stay connected in intimate with God and ask the Holy Spirit to know, you know, when are the times, when to focus on what, whether we are focusing on one gift more than the other. So we need the help of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So lastly, we look at Jesus as a primary example of um, uh, each of these uh, ministry gifts. Okay. So um, the Jesus. Flow in all the fivefold ministry offices? Yes. Okay. So, as an apostle, how do we know Jesus was an apostle? Or how can you say Jesus was an apostle? You said yes, so you need to tell me. Hey. How was Jesus an apostle? He made disciples. Does apostles just make disciples? What's the role of an apostle? Planting churches, also what? What is the main role of an apostle? Builds up, actually initiates or pioneers something that is new in some new places, okay, which is not done before. An apostle is somebody who pioneers new initiatives, new things uh, in the places that no one has gone before or no work has been done there. So how is Jesus an apostle? Okay, that's not really the thing. What did Jesus, when he came, what did he inaugurate or establish? The kingdom of God, right? He established the kingdom of God. He was sent by God on earth. One of the reasons was to establish the kingdom of God. Okay, And he also was the one who laid the foundation of the he laid the foundation of what? Church. Yes, he laid the foundation of the church. And he also set into motion the mission for his followers. How to do mission work. That's why he did. He sent out, right? And he gave them all authority. He told them what to do. So he set into motion mission work. He laid the foundation for the church. And he has also established the kingdom of God. Okay. So if you look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Can somebody read Hebrews 3, verse 1, please? Online students and need your help. Hebrews 3 1. Hebrews 3 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Amen. So here it's saying Jesus as is the apostle and the high priest of our confession. Okay. So how is Jesus the prophet? He prophesied about the second coming. Okay, what else? Did Jesus call himself as a prophet? Matthew chapter 13, verse 57. Can you read that, please? Someone, Matthew 13, 57. Okay, so they took offense at Jesus, but Jesus said to them, "A prophet is without honor except in his own in his hometown and his own household." So, who is he referring to as a prophet? Himself. Okay. So, how was Jesus as a prophet? What is basically the role of a prophet? Look at the Old Testament, New Testament. 
Old Testament gives us more clarity. What is the role of a prophet? Okay, not just foretelling and forth telling. What else? To hear from God and say, okay. Okay, that's foretelling and foretelling. What else is the nature of a prophet? God's message to God's people, okay. A prophet basically reveals the nature and attributes of God to man. Okay, God is angry, God is upset. This is what he wants to be done. This is what he's saying. This is say, he's saying he's upset. He, he's saying you've gone away from his way. So he's they're basically revealing God's nature and attributes um, to men. Also, prophets make known to men the laws of God, right? And they also call back people to the obedience to God's laws. Okay, so that is the third thing. They also exhort people to worship God sincerely. So first one is they reveal the nature and attributes of God to men. They make known to men the laws of God. They call people back to obedience to God's laws. They exhort people to worship God in sincerity, in truth. Okay, if you look at the Old Testament, we see all of these things, right? They also warn people about divine judgment, right? Sin, both personal and corporate, national, uh, community. Okay, so they warn people of divine judgment. They also foretell future events that God has planned and purposed. Okay, so these are some of the nature of, you know, the prophets and what the prophets do. So having this in mind, uh, how can we say Jesus is a prophet? Yes, he revealed the nature and the attributes of God, uh, uh, of God the Father to mankind. What else? When he taught about the kingdom of God, he made known the laws of the kingdom of God. He called people to the obedience to God's laws. He also told them your sacrifices are, you know, it's, it's futile. But God is looking for worshippers who worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay. He also warns them about sin, right? Personal and national. And he also tells them about the future events, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And um, so we see that in those sense, Jesus was a prophet. He operated as a prophet in speaking God's truth. He called people to repentance like a prophet would do. And we also see like prophets face rejection in the Old Testament. He was also rejected. Okay. Now, if you look at some scripture passages in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, you know, Moses predicts that God would send another prophet like him to the people of Israel. Okay. I'll, I'll read that. Um, it says, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18 says, I will raise up for them a prophet like among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and they shall speak to them and I will command them. And we see that in Acts chapter 3, uh, Peter, when he's preaching the sermon, he's telling in verses 22 to 24, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. So basically Peter is trying to prove that Jesus is a prophet. Jesus was basically prophesied about his coming in the Old Testament. And so he's saying, hey, when Moses tells, uh, it truly said that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, he was talking about Jesus Christ. Okay. So when, um, when Jesus did many signs, miracles and wonders, what was the people's response? John chapter 6 verse 14. They said, truly this is a prophet who is coming to the world. Okay, if you look at John chapter 7, verse 440, the crowd said when they heard Jesus truly, this is a prophet. Okay, so we see that Jesus fulfilled the role of a prophet. He was also an evangelist. How do we know that? He went about teaching, proclaiming the kingdom of God, you know, reaching out to the lost, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, bringing salvation to many. What does Jesus say in Luke chapter 19 verse 10? For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Okay. How is Jesus a pastor? 
Till at the sheep, John chapter 10, verses 11 to 16, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So the pastor is, you know, uh, given the son of a picture of a shepherd. So a pastor takes care of his flock. He guides them, protects them, lays down his life for them. And that is what Jesus did. And as a teacher, yes, Jesus went around Matthew 9, 35. Jesus went around all cities and villages, teaching, preaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and disease. So we see that Jesus was a master teacher. He explained the scriptures. He revealed the truth of the kingdom of God. He taught about the kingdom of God. He also taught his disciples how to live a life of faith. So we see all the fivefold emphasis fulfilled in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So Pastor Paul will continue from here on. So happy journey with him. Enjoy your... Uh, yes. So um, uh, Jesus is saying that in the town of Nazareth, Okay, and um, uh, then the people did not have faith in what he was doing, that, and they did not believe that he was Messiah. Even though he was doing mighty signs, miracles, and wonders, they said, can Joseph's son do all of these things? So Jesus is saying in his own, even in the town of Bethesda, there was no faith. That's why I remember that blind man comes, he takes him out of the city. So he says, and Jesus says, woe to you, you know, Korah, if, uh, if um, the city of Tyre and Sidon and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah had heard the good news, they would have repented, unlike Bethesda and, you know, the other cities. Like, the city of Nazareth, even though they saw mighty signs, miracles and wonders, they did not believe that Jesus was a prophet or the Messiah. And, uh, Apart from Jesus in the scripture, do we find anyone with all the fivefold ministry offices? Uh, I think Paul also a little, I don't know the prophetic office, but yes, the others may be. Pastor, apostle, teacher. Oh, in my memory, if I know of anyone, who uh, who uh, is uh, in all of these fivefold offices? No, I don't see anything. But Jesus maybe had uh, operated in all the fivefold because maybe he yes. they wanted to set a model and example that we could and what each entailed that office and that calling. Yes. Good questions. Okay, thank you everyone. Enjoy the rest of the course with Pastor Paul and Thank you. God bless. Thank you. 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 Thank you.